All right, give another 30 seconds or so, then we'll get started three past the hour. All right, three past the hour, why don't I go ahead and get started? Let's see, um, community time. Any topics from the community that people wanna bring up? All right, not hearing any. Uh, no update on SDK, I believe I'll call schedule for next week. So hope maybe next week we'll have something to mention. Uh, KuCon EU recap, uh, two things. One is during the service working group session, um, uh, most of it was actually a birds of a feather kind of thing, where we basically tried to engage the audience to get their feedback on things like, you know, why they're using serverless, why they're not using serverless, what their pain points are, and stuff like that. I'm not going to go through this document here, but I did want to point out this document to you guys if you're interested in hearing or reading the notes on the session itself in terms of the feedback we got from people. The link is right here in the agenda doc, so you guys can take a look at that later if you want. However, I did want to leave an opportunity for people who were at KubeCon to mention something uh, in general that they thought might be of interest to the group. So does anybody have anything from KubeCon that they want to mention that might be of interest? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. Um, KubeCon China, um, slides are not available yet. Um, as soon as those are ready, uh, Kathy and I will make those available for the group to review. But one thing I do want to mention is that I do want if possible for you guys to keep your endpoints up for the demo, because I, I am planning on showcasing the demo uh, during our session or one of one of the two sessions there. So please keep your endpoints up so we can run the demo there. Um, I'd appreciate that. Uh, next week on Tuesday, I believe, we'll have the TOC call, which I will ask about the criteria for going to incubator. Um, just, just a reminder for everybody that that's coming up. And I will ask this question about whether there's a requirement for us to be beta or a certain version number. I, I think the answer is no, but I will confirm that with the group. All right, on to PRs. Are, is there any other topic people want to bring up before we get to PRs? All right, in that case, Jem, you are up first. This is a relatively easy one. You want to talk to this one? Yeah, we like easy, low-hanging fruit stuff. Um, <laughs> so. I, I just happened to look at the, the JSON um, schema uh, and it just had the subject omitted. I guess it was, you know, we added subject as a context property um, and just missed it. So I've added it in. All right. Seems fairly straightforward. Anybody have any questions or comments on this? I, I do have some comments on the overall structure of the schema. This is a bit funky to me, but, but I understand what it's doing. Uh, well, obviously, you can open up another issue or PR if you want to change that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any questions, comments on this one? Any I, objection? I have oh. a question. Is it in? So this is spec.json. Does it need to be added to any of like to anything else, or is this the only place where it was left out? I'm, I correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. But I believe this is my place it was left out. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 yeah, I just happened to spot it when I was looking at the, that um, schema file. Okay. I think this might actually be the only schema type of document we have in the in the repo at all. I, I believe so. there is a there is a protobuf one, but protobuf um, is slight you know is slightly different form. So um, I did check that, and there's no change required to that one. Okay. So does this one actually have a schema to it? Yeah, it does. Um, oh, it does. Interesting. There is a, there's a separate schema file. Um, there's a spec.proto or something in the repo. Really? Uh, 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 somewhere. Oh, there it is. Huh. Yeah. It's much okay. simpler. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, going backwards. Any objection to, to approving this one then? Nope. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Anybody else? All right. Not hearing any objection. We can approve. Thank you, Jeff, for that. All right. Um, now, Clemens is not on the call, but I did want to at least bring this one up for people's attention. Let's see. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> so basically, if I have this correct, oops, let me sort of hide the comments here. One second. 
so basically this is this PR is trying to address the problem that I can't remember who it was from Google um, might have been Alan mentioned that we're putting quotes around our HTTP headers or the spec requires us to put quotes around HTTP headers even though we don't really want to do that and what I believe Clement is proposing here is to basically at the spec level well not, let me phrase it differently what he wants to do is is define a string encoding format for all of our different types and then say for things like HTTP um, use the string encoding for those particular types and then the receiver when if they understand the type of that particular attribute it can convert it into the appropriate type so for example a, a timestamp type for example but for any types that people do not understand they'll just keep it as a string and then pass it along as appropriate that I think is the basic idea here um, I wanted to, I want, like I said, I want to put this out there for people to start commenting on it and, and, and think about it. Um, obviously Clemens will do more speaking of it next week when he's on the call, but I wanted to get people's initial reaction to it. Um, in particular, Scott, I was wondering if you had a chance to look at this one and, and think about it and you too, Jim, I'm going to pick on you next. Sorry. <laughs> so Scott, have you had a chance to think about this one? Cause I know this was a topic that was near and dear to your heart. Basically what I do today. Okay, so I take it that means you're in favor of this direction? Yeah. Okay. Now, Jem, what about you? Because I know you at one point indicated you would really prefer to have the type as part of the encoding itself. Yeah, because the, the way I read this when I quickly went through it, it's basically saying it's up to the SDKs to understand the types of the underlying attributes. Yeah, so or, or at least that the transport spec has to understand the type system so that it can move stuff backwards and forwards um, based on the name of the attribute um, rather than explicitly in the type, in the um, protocol itself. So, I mean, I, I don't quite understand how this works for extensions, for instance. Um, I guess I need to read it a bit more. I don't understand how an intermediary can forward an extension without it losing its type information. Um, and I also don't understand how an intermediary could forward maybe a new rev of the spec without losing its type information. So that, that's, that, that I need to read it more deeply. Yeah, so I, I, Scott, correct me if I get this wrong here, but I believe that extension, for the unknown extensions are basically just passed around as strings. So there is no type information whatsoever. If you yeah, know about right. yeah, if you know about the type of the extension, then obviously it's just like any other attribute. You can convert it as, you know, as part of the SDK or application code, but um, but in general, unknown extensions are just strings. Is the short answer? I also think it's a non-goal to to be able to convert between cloud event versions without being version aware. Yeah, I don't know whether that's a goal or not. I don't I don't remember it stay, being stated as a goal. So yeah. But I definitely recommend people look at this because I do think it it feels like it could have big ramifications for us, even though I do agree with the direction and I think it's the right way to go. I think it's not that big of a code change. Philosophically, it is a bit of a different way to view things and I want people to be very comfortable with this. So I'm not gonna like ask for a vote or anything today, but I do want people to, to be prepared for potentially voting on it next week. Because I know that I've heard from more than one uh, group of people that they would like to try to move the spec as close as we can to 1.0 sooner rather than later. And this is one of the, the biggest items that's lingering for us to resolve. So I'm gonna to try to push for a vote next week if people are okay with that. Anyway, Tapini, your hands up. Yeah, uh, I thought it was, it is an interesting point that this will affect how extensions can evolve and also how conflicting extensions will uh, see each other. Um, earlier, if you would have had a conflict in the type, you would have noticed in the type. Um, now, if you have a conflict, it will just be a malformed string in the next um, in the next extension version. Or if you have conflicting extensions that expect different types, which have special meaning but are encoded as a string without any identifiers. Can, can you elaborate on how you thought? 
other proposals address that? Because I'm not sure they did, right? Because if two people uh, define... I don't think nothing has particularly um, solved that, but this just alters how that works now without it being, because this will um, define how that would work. They would just be strings that have special meaning, but are malformed for each other if they expect different types. It's just okay. a side effect that yeah. came to my head. Okay, gotcha. Okay. But Anybody the, else? Oh, sorry. Uh, hand. No, go ahead. You're up. Uh, I, I think the, I think that's actually a benefit because, in the, in the previous case, you'd have, an int trying to be, passed in as a string, and that would just runtime exception. Now we have a chance to actually inspect the string because you know the type ahead of time, no matter what the actual type is. That is actually true, and a good point. Thank you, Scott. Anybody else have any questions or comments on this one? Or any points for discussion today? Okay, you guys are awfully quiet. Okay, in that case, yeah, please take your time to, to look this over, because um, if there are no uh, comments or concerns before next week's call, I, I will ask you know, if you're okay with approving it. So if you do have concerns, please get them out there sooner rather than later so that the clients could try to address them. And Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we do approve that one, that resolves your PR, correct? Does it supersede the idea of encoding the, the bytes of JSON inside the headers? Like yeah. I, it's, it's the first step. There's another augmentation we have to write to the, um, the HTTP binary specification to say that we, unless it does, okay, it does. That's what, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Right? Here's the HTTP binding. Here's the examples. Yeah, uh, yeah canonical string. This would make uh, my job a lot more clear. Okay. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I believe in this one, um, Clemens hasn't, hasn't had a chance to respond to my message but I believe the interesting thing is if you have an extension that's technically defined as a map, it will appear this entire JSON looking thing will actually just appear as a string. It will not actually come across as a JSON object unless the receiver happens to know it's a, a map and then and, and, you know, converts it for you. But if it's an unknown extension, it will just get passed along as a string. That's true today. Um, it's not true for maps because they have a different encoding. Uh, uh, I forget. Never mind. Yeah, you're right. I forgot we do maps special. I don't like that, but yeah, <laughs> I forgot. So technically, you're right. This should be CE mod extension dash foo, right? Anyway, that's right. I think that's what we say today. Yeah, uh, I forgot about that. Additionally, today, if those are supposed to be string quoted for, to make it a string, um, you'd have to par parse it as a map rather than a string. Yeah. Okay, I'll fix my comment. All right. Um, anything else on this PR? Okay. As I said, please take a look at that when you get a chance. And let's see, moving forward. This PR has been out there for a little while. I did make some very minor changes this morning just to do a little bit better alignment in the difference between producer versus um, source. I don't think it fundamentally changed what's in here. I don't know if everybody has a chance to read it yet, but I'll give you guys like just about 30 seconds or so to, to read through this, see what you guys think. Okay. Any questions on this? Does this seem consistent with the direction we've been going, especially with our recent discussions around uh, the un uniqueness aspect between source and ID and stuff like that? Um, I don't know if it's worth specifying when we say from a single event source, meaning 
the same source string. There's, there's sort of a conflation of the idea of an event source and then the source attribute. Yeah, I guess when I wrote this up, I was assuming that when I say, you know, things like one event source or single event source, that means the same source string. Um, I guess I could be a little more explicit if you think that'd be clearer. Um, I mean, I, th I feel like it might be good to be clear that um, that string, you know, is an identity space for event sources and there isn't any other identity space. So um, maybe that's part of the source attribute, but historically that's been a little bit loose about what the source attribute looks like and how that maps onto systems that produce events. Yeah, so I do actually call it out right here, <clears throat> but I guess what I could do is take this part of the sentence and move it up to the top to make it clear that I'm talking about the same event source. I mean the same attribute source value or source attribute value. I could I can move that sentence up higher and make it clear that it applies to all cases, not just this one paragraph. Okay, I can do that. Anything else? Is it, is source a required field? I believe so. Let me just double check. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you, Scott. Yes. Yeah, I think it's spec ID, our spec version number, source ID, and type are the four required fields. Does that change any of this for you, Jim? No, no. My, I just I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Okay. So, okay. okay. So any other? Questions or concerns about this one? Okay, let me ask this question. Um, I do want to make the edit that Evan was suggesting, because I think it probably is a good one, but I believe that's a relatively minor change. It's basically taking this type of, this stuff that I've highlighted and basically moving it a little bit higher to make it clear. Uh, I think it's a relatively minor wordsmithing change. Would you guys be okay with, assuming we approve it now, with conditionally approving this um, with that change and then I'll make the change and wait for one or two LGTMs offline and then merge it. Would you guys be okay with that direction? So I don't have to wait a whole nother week for a relatively minor wording change? Yeah, that seems fine to me. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Any, okay, let me ask the first question. Any objection to approving this with that wording change as, as suggested by Evan? I'm basically taking this part here and moving it up higher. Okay, and any objection then to doing sort of a deferred merge based upon that edit? Based upon the edit. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Whoops, what did I just do? Okay. Um, hold on. Okay, I'll take care of that. Thank you, Evan. All right. Technically, this is the last PR that can be reviewed today. Everything else has some issues with it. Um, so Scott, I want to pick on you for a sec. So I added this text here basically to talk about the role of event producers that are separate from the event sources, meaning you have this entity whose job it is, is to create the cloud event um, on behalf of the source. And I basically go into a, some ramblings about, you know, what they how they should go about doing that and how they're not necessarily there to to represent themselves they're there to represent the event source it's just the source wasn't produced in the cloud event um now scott you had, had originally had some concerns about this and i was wondering whether those concerns are still applicable or, or you're still worried about them or based upon the recent discussions around source and type and stuff whether those concerns that you had are you know go away I believe they're still there. You, you still are stomping the namespace of the, the original producer of the event. So can you point me to where in here I actually say that? I, I, I haven't read this, the new text yet. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't want to rush this, especially since, since Scott, you think you still may, some, may have some concerns with it. Um, so let me just do, put this out there. Please, everybody, when you get a chance, please look at this. And in particular, if, um, if you're writing a, uh, for lack of a better phrase, an adapter, something that will take an event from an event source and convert it to a cloud event, 
please make sure that there's no text in here that you think would, would make it so you're now violating something or not adhering to the guidance in here. Or if you just think I'm just way off base, let me know. Um, but I do think that we do need some better clarity because I think there are some people who have different expectations for what event producers do. Um, like whether, for example, whether they uh, put data in there representing themselves or or whether they put data in there just that represents the event source. And I think understanding when it's appropriate to do each one of those, because I do think that there are times when it is valid to do each one of those, but understanding when those times are valid would be very useful. And I do talk about that in there, but it is a little bit of a ramble. So please take a look at when you get a chance. Um, but based upon what you guys may have looked at already, does anybody have any questions or comments that they want to bring up now to, for discussion? Yeah, otherwise, we'll just do it offline. Okay, you guys are awfully quiet. Okay, so please review that when you get a chance. Um, technically, that's it for the for open PRs that are that can't actually be resolved today. I'm trying to think if there's anything in here that we can discuss. Yeah, classes are on the call, so I was going to ask about this one. Um, okay. Before we actually adjourn, since <laughs> if there's anything else on the agenda, let me do one other thing here. Hold on a minute. So these are the only PRs that I've actually tagged as 0 0.3. Um, I believe that these last two technically should be closed because um, they were, um, these are the ones that Christoph proposed and we ended up going with Clemens size constraint PR instead. So I think once we resolve Clemens PR, all three of these will go away. So really the only PRs we have open for 0 0.3 is the, uh, the type system one that we are talking about earlier. Um, if you guys think there are other things that we need to get in for 0 0.3, please let me know, because otherwise I'm gonna assume that once these are resolved, we will be able to go forward with a vote on 0 0.3 and get that next release out there, okay? I, I still have huge questions about how to actually implement batching. Okay. I, I, I wrote an issue for it and uh, I, But is that a concern for 0 0.3 or just a general question? Well, batching was added for 0 0.3 and so the release of 0 0.3 then uh, forces everyone to support batching if they want. Well, I guess it's optional, but I have no idea how to support it. <laughs> well, tell you what, why don't we, okay, so. So do me a favor, since we have a little bit of time right now. I'm not, I, I think I might agree with Evan that it may not necessarily be a blocker for zero three, but I think we can look at that offline and, and decide that. Obviously, it, I think it's a requirement for, zero, for one O, obviously. But can you take some time right now to, elaborate on where your concerns are around batching? I mean, it's, it's written here. Uh, I don't know what to do if, if the, I'm delivering something to some other entity in a, like I, there needs to be more guidance on how delivery happens for the batched thing and what processing should be and what happens when delivery of the middle event fails and how do you upstream that response it's a, there's just not a lot of guidance on how to actually deal with batching of requests. Uh, it sounds like in particular in the failure case where you want to act, say, events one and three, but not event two. That... Yeah, exactly. Or, uh, you know, one and two are okay, but three caused a failure. Do, do you knack all of them? Or I, I don't know how to do that stuff. I'm just trying to refresh my memory on what we say in batch mode here for HCP at least. Does this thing talk about how to handle failures or responses at all? I mean, it's, it's probably more interesting to look at the, the definition of what batch mode is and not the, the bindings for it. Because the bindings are pretty clear. It's the oh. operation that I have a question about. When you say, the, well, the spec doesn't talk about batching at all, does it? I thought that was just an HTTP semantic. Yeah, I don't see anything about batching in the spec. Let me see if the primer mentions it.
Yeah, so we basically say it's up to the transport to define it. <clears throat> so are you looking for something within the, the main spec itself, Scott? Yeah, I, I think because the if you're transport agnostic, like what happens when uh, some middleware batches HTTP requests and then goes and tries to enqueue that onto an AMQ PQ, but it encounters a problem with, with the middle event? Like what, what should that thing do? Can you elaborate on why you don't think that'd be a transport specific issue? Well, it's a cloud event issue, right? Like a, a piece of, pretend you're middleware and you receive a batch request over HTTP and your job is to forward it onto some other thing that doesn't support batching. What is the exact operations you're supposed to do? Let's, let's say the negotiation, you, let's say in HTTP, you get a batched request and then you're supposed to deliver it to a, a non-batched client. And so you deliver one, two, three, and the third one gets an error. Do you knack or act the upstream request? It's batched. Okay, okay. Uh, let me go to the, to the queue. Jam your hands up. Uh, it's interesting because I, if, if if I remember correctly, the only thing in our specs which talk about error codes and performance is the webhook spec. Nothing, everything else is sort of very agnostic on, on transport. Because I, you know, I had a similar question, what does this mean to the SDKs? Do they have to support batching as well? Um, I, I, I understand the spirit of what it was written, but I, I, I completely get the problem of what an intermediary is meant to do when presented with one of those things. What's the expectation? Yeah, uh, Jude, you're up. Oh. Yeah, um, can you link that, uh, the document that you just brought a, couple, a while ago where there was, there was an example of two put batch requests? It's in the uh, HTTP binding spec. Oh, okay, got it, thanks. I assume you meant this one, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, my, my larger question here was, um, if we ever want to get batched in like, you know, in the spec, then can we make assumptions saying that the spec version for the entire batch is the same? And so it's better to kind of have like this metadata object and then the batch events like a more structured way. Yeah, I think my, my assumption is always it's the same version of her, although I'm not sure we explicitly say that. We, uh, yeah, it does right here. Yeah. Yep. So it makes it a little bit easier. So let me ask you this question though, Scott. Um, do you have an idea for the direction you would like us to go? Because if you say yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for a PR. <laughs> yeah, I don't because I don't have a ton of experience in batch processing. I don't know what the standard is that people actually would expect. Okay. So when, I, go ahead. Uh, so when we did it uh, at, at massive scale, we kind of uh, just had our own implementation. Like it wasn't specific to a uh, general thing because it was highly context dependent. So just out of curiosity, to, in some of the scenarios that Scott has mentioned, how did you deal with those? So for example, if there are three different events batched up and the, the middle one fails in some way, how do you deal with that? Do you have three different responses and the middle one indicates some sort of failure or does only the middle one give a response? No, so uh, yeah, the middle one would be... Oh man. Okay, yeah. So the response would include that uh, success and failure. And the ordinals of the array, which failed. Got it, okay. I, I think this has to be worked into the, um, uh, the webhook spec some, somewhere because that's the only thing that talks about behavior, yeah? Um, and actually, one might argue that that should also, in the options call, say, well, I don't support batching, so don't bother trying to send me something with a batch. The, there's this it's probably the other direction I do support batching rather than sure yeah I mean you, you should be able to garner some indication about whether batch mode is supported yeah 
Okay, because I'm getting the sense that if nothing else, even if we don't change any of the specs, something might be useful for the primer. Because um, if Scott, you had some, some uncertainty around this, I'm sure other people will as well. So we need to think about what we can write. Yeah, I mean, try implementing it and then you'll discover some um, interesting corner cases. Yeah. So, but I'm trying to figure out the best way to move forward here. Um, because what I, what I really want to say is, or what I really want to do is ask for a volunteer to put together a straw man proposal of a direction and see whether people agree with that proposed direction. So for example, Scott, what would you have liked to have seen that would have made your life easier as you implemented this? Is it guidance that says how to handle responses and errors? Is that, is that enough to have, would that been enough to have satisfy your, your issue? Potentially what, uh, Jude's put in a, the chat. It's a, the, it, it, it becomes very difficult because uh, HTTP res allows for responses and, and batching. So you need to accommodate for new events that come as a result of the batch, but also some method of knowing that uh, this ID was act in the batch that you sent. It's, something like that would help, I think. But it's really complicated. Well, what, what's interesting, and I feel that my inner Clemens being channeled here, is events are typically are are basically one way messages, right? I mean, we don't even talk about. That's not true. The cloud event spec says that if the the transport allows for it, the a cloud event can be bidirectional. Well, yes, you can send an event to both directions. But what I was thinking more along the lines of is when you send an event to a receiver there's no, we don't have to define an ACK, right? I mean, because you could recite back with a 202, which means nothing other than I got the message, right? And there's no confirmation that it's been processed correctly. And we don't tell you how to send back any message or any kind of indication that it was processed correctly. So if you take that to the next level and say, okay, well, if we're not going to have any kind of NAC defined for single events, why would we bother doing it for batched? And I think that's my point. Yeah, it's only the cloud event, the, the webhook spec that talks about response codes. So th that would be my argument as to where that batch handling should go. Yeah, so I guess my question for you, Scott, is if you think of this as asynchronous processing, where, why do you want to send a response at all? Uh, because the spec allows well no the, the spec allows for you to send a cloud event in a response flow but it's not necessarily a response message right you <laughs> no no it, the request allows for a response uh, an event response and we need to be pointed at the same thing can you point me to a, a document that talks about what you're referring to right the, the this binding spec for HTTP says that the bindings apply for both inbound and outbound responses. So you can infer that that means that if you send an, a cloud event, it may respond with a cloud event. Well, hold on a minute. I know, I know what you're talking about. I just can't seem to find it. Hold on. Um, here we go. Let's talk about something like this, right? I mean, right. responses is, is referenced a couple times in this document. Yeah, I guess that th th maybe we need Clemens on here since, <clears throat> since he was the main author here, but I interpreted sentences like this to say that yes, cloud events can be transferred over HTTP responses, but that's not quite, <clears throat> excuse me, the same thing as saying that, that an event, that, that we are defining cloud events as responses to cloud events. So for example, the request could have been, do you have any, any events for me? And it's not necessarily a cloud event on the request side. It's more like a pull request. But the cloud event itself could flow or race your response flow. I don't think you can make that assumption on, like if you're writing an SDK, for example, you potentially any request can respond with a cloud event, even delivering a cloud event. Sure. No, I, I agree, it could. My point is we don't draw any relationship between the two. The okay, fact that- 
But if you implement that and you uh, try to support batching, you get real confused on what to do. So let me ask you this. What do you think the specs say about non-batching message flows? Meaning you send a request, you send a cloud event or a request. What's supposed to flow over the response? It's up to that implementation. Right. So why would batching be any different? The, the, the cloud events spec says that you can respond with stuff or not stuff. Like I, at some point, you actually have to help people understand what, what that error code, if it's, if it's in the webhook spec or what, like you are delivered a, a batched request and you respond back with 400, what does that mean? I guess I, my question is, what does it mean in the single case? Yeah, what, uh, what does it mean is it that you probably should knack whatever upstream thing or maybe re-deliver. It depends on your implementation. Mm. But it's, it's pretty clear that that 400 re ap applies to the, the request that was delivered. The cloud event was sent to some, some hook. It responded with 400. It's, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. But when you send a batched request, you don't understand. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm, like I said, I'm just trying to figure out the next steps here. So, Tapini, your hands up. Yeah, just kind of tangential to what you were talking about just now. But Jude Pereira brings up a good point that um, responding with JSON arrays is not a good idea because some browsers don't support it. So, there should be some kind of a envelope anyway to the batches. Likely better the, the the stream would have been better the uh, non square bracket enclosed stream of JSON objects. So not batched, but a stream. So, so Scott, are you basically looking for something in one of our docs that says when you're doing batching, here's what the response message needs to look like, so that you know the the responses of each individual in essence request. Right. Uh, Jim, your hands up. I, I, I understand where it's coming from, I really do. But I mean, I'm, in my mind, I'm trying to separate this spec from the transport specs. Uh, and none of our specs talk about acknowledgements of publishing or anything like that, yeah, that I've read. Um, that seems to be very much left to an SDK writer as to how he wants to, he or she, sorry, wants to represent that. Yeah, I think that's where I'm struggling with this as well. Because um, it, it, it seems to me that if I was writing an SDK for an HTTP transport, I could choose to batch stuff up and send it in one operation, yeah. Um, I could choose to do it asynchronously or synchronously or, or whatever. I mean, I don't think we've placed it. the specs don't put any commentary around an upstream person knowing whether their thing's been accepted by anybody, except, and I'll come back to the webhook spec, you know, which is the only only other endpoint that has only endpoint that has that sort of behaviour. Maybe that's right or wrong. I, we don't have anything similar for an AM, you know, a distant AMQP endpoint and, and delivery confirmations from there. So um, I understand the problem, but it, it's not unique to HTTP, I don't think. Yeah, part of me is also wondering whether this is, I'm not trying to struggle with to find the right words, whether this is not necessarily our problem in the sense that if you have two systems today that are trying to exchange events, especially in the binary format, right, where cloud events is meant to just be extra sprinkling of metadata. It's not meant to be a complete reformat of stuff. So if you have two systems that are talking to one another and they're transferring events back and forth, we'll add some extra metadata to those events and that's great, everything works. <clears throat> but the minute you start talking about batching, if the current mechanism that they're using to transfer those events doesn't already support batching, 
I don't think they're going to add it because of us. So that means to me that they, if they're going to do batching, they would have already supported it, which means they would have already solved this problem themselves. And the fact that are, there's now extra metadata in there with the cloud event attributes is almost irrelevant or it, it, it doesn't impact this problem space. Does that make any sense? Except we define explicitly how to batch uh, structured cloud events on HTTP, but not how to process them. Uh, it's definitely true. Why we yes. did a half job there. Yeah, that is true. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't think we're going to necessarily solve it here, but I think there are a lot of interesting points that were brought up. So maybe what we should do is, is try to force the discussion in this issue that Scott opened. And who knows? Maybe the net result would be we re remove batching and say, if you want to do it, fine, but you know, use whatever batching mechanism you would have used normally, if, even if you weren't using cloud events. But I want to keep it in. I, I think it's there for a reason. I think there's an efficiency play there. Yeah. Um, does that mean everybody has to support it? I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, but if, if nothing else, I think to address Scott's concern, we should at least say what to do for responses slash errors. And maybe the answer is we're going to say nothing, but then we should explicitly say someplace we're not going to touch that subject. I just want something in, I just want people who's reading, who are reading our, our spec and primer to know whether we purposely chose not to work on something or we just forgot. And I don't want them to think we forgot. Okay, I, I'll, I'm willing to take a look at the webhook spec and see if I can work something into that. Because uh, that's your HTTP endpoint behavior definition, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you, Jim, I appreciate that. Okay, um, let's see, where were we? Oh yeah, so going back, um, please look at the list of 0 0.3 um, uh, PRs. I believe that they're a small list. If you think I'm missing, let me know. Other than that, I think we're at the end of the agenda. <clears throat> you guys just have lots of homework to do in terms of um, reviewing stuff that's out there. So please, when you get a chance, review those. In particular, Clemens PR is a really, really big one. Uh, so please look at that. Um, I think that's it. Are there any other topics people would like to bring up for today's call? All right, in that case, one last little bit of work. Mehmet, are you there? Mehmet? Is there anybody else I missed for attendance? Uh, yes, I am here. Oh, Mehmet, gotcha. I, I knew you were there. Okay, anybody else that I missed for attendance? All right, in that case, we'll end early today. Thank you guys very much. And we'll talk again next week. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, Doug.